Hello and welcome to this, the Crypto Club and Digital Assets Weekly Catch-Up on Zoom. It is Sunday the 21st of April 2024 and as is always the case, we never quite know exactly what we're going to be talking about. On these sessions, we typically talk about Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain, DeFi, NFTs, ICOs, STOs, any other three letter acronyms really. We sometimes have conversations about uh, CBDCs or central bank digital currencies, about the metaverse and about the impact of technology and blockchain when it all comes together. If you're new to the world of blockchain and crypto, then do stick around, hopefully you learn something. If you're running a project and you'd like to share some information, then come along. We meet every Sunday evening, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. UK time. And we have our gone in three minute sessions where you can talk about whatever you're working on. It's always something of interest for everybody. So do stick around, do click on the like, subscribe, make comments. Even better, come on to a future session. With that, let's see who's going to come join us today. Hey, Stefan. Hello. Welcome back. Thank Hello. you. Good to see you again. And Gabrielle as well. Hey, Gabrielle. Hi, everyone. A couple of regulars joining us nice and early there. That's always good. And it looks like Ada's trying to connect as well. We're having some um, sound problems at the moment. Stefan, did you enjoy last week's session? Uh, you mean the, our discussion or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I was actually really excited for that guy who was working for Crypto.com. I was yeah. wondering how, how do people get these type of jobs? Because I, I was thinking about trying to, do, to get like a job in a crypto company. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't really been very successful. And my level of programming, I don't think it's that good to be able to work in like programming. So I was curious how he managed. <laughs> okay yeah I'm, I'm not sure what, which area he, he works on within crypto.com as to whether it is on the on the tech side or not from what i understood he was like working in the uh, in community management yeah so i was thinking that he was more like a moderator for uh, telegram and perhaps other groups of uh, yeah social groups i i think you might be right and that, that's the thing that you get to discover that in the, in the crypto world there's lots of opportunities for marketing people, for social media people, for community managers, all this kind of thing. You don't necessarily have to be a techie tech person, although it can True. be useful. <laughs> it can be useful. Yeah. I, 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 I still don't get it how, how these jobs work, to be honest. <laughs> well, I, I, get, I guess you apply and you find out as you go along. Probably, yeah. yeah. But, um, it'll be interesting to see... Who, who joins us today, um, given that we had the Bitcoin halving um, a day or so ago, yeah. and that, that generated hardly any activity at all, which is exactly what I expected. But there was also a big crypto conference, in fact, two, two conferences in Dubai last week, which... Do you think is going to go lower from, let's say, 59 I've got no idea. I, I tend to avoid trying to do price predictions. The, the, only, the only prices yeah. I ever offer is it's going to be somewhere between zero and lots of <laughs> that thing. You want um, to play safe. Yeah, it, it, exactly. But all, also, I, I still recognize that crypto prices can drop substantially. And it, yeah. it's interesting in the last week, I've seen that there was a price correction during the week. And loads of people were saying, oh, no, you know, the Bitcoin price has collapsed. And it's like it dropped 15%. In, in crypto yeah. world, that's not that major. And in fact, yeah. I, I think it went down to about 50 or something um, from a high of 70. And it's like, look, it started the year, at, I think it was about 35. Mm -hmm. So it, it's still like 50% higher than it started the year, and you're calling it a collapse. So. These uh, are definitely new people or people who don't, they, they don't have like very good hands. And they ex like exactly. Every small thing. And I think this is good because when you, when we look into like metrics on like other people and people who search for cryptocurrency, there aren't many people. But I also think it's also another factor for the fact that people already know about crypto. Like I literally have friends and whenever I see people who are not into crypto, I always try and ask them, what do you know about crypto? What do you think? And all this, they know about that is the future of money and all these things. So 
I think this idea doesn't really pales that much anymore to people. I think it's just like price is going up. If if we won't have like a game that will will become like mainstream, I I don't think that would be something. <laughs> I think it's just gonna be like normal investments. As you invest in stock market, only people who want to invest in like stock market, they are going to start looking into crypto. In my yeah. opinion. I, I think you may be right, and you're, you're absolutely right that the people who are new to crypto, I mean, you look at this price chart, this is the one-hour chart for Bitcoin at the moment mm -hmm. that, that I've pulled up, and so it, it's ranging anywhere between, what's that, 59, they're at, uh, like to drop down to ju just over 60, yeah. um, and its peak was like 67, so that, that's like a 10% drop, and in in stocks and shares, that is catastrophic. You know, yeah. if, if a share dropped ten percent on the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq, people cry. Um, <laughs> exactly. But you, you take a look at you know over time with Bitcoin. You know, it it's gone from what's this here um, sixty five down to fifteen at one point. So that's a a seventy five percent drop, I think. Yeah, yeah, so so it's it's potentially got a far wider range, and this is the whole thing that I, I always say. You know, Bitcoin hasn't collapsed; it's just correcting itself. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, for people who aren't used to these markets, um, they they think it's the end of the world and everything. It's like, no, I've seen this four times now. It happens. Mm -hmm. So so this is why I I, I do accept the. I think Bitcoin could still drop down a lot, lot lower. It's it's unlikely it will, um, yeah. but it, it, that that doesn't mean it won't. Type thing. So, what well, what's your thinking at the moment? How closely are you watching it? I mean, to be honest, I am like glued to the phone. You know, for since two thousand eight seventeen, I was glued to the phone. Since I discovered crypto, that's the only thing I did. Like, it it changed my life at one point, but I was too too stupid. But I I've been glued to the phone. The idea of being able to have money that you can send them from one phone to another yep. and nobody to be able to stop it. For me, it's still like mind bending for me. Yeah. And uh, I try to talk with my family, but they, they don't really think much about it. I, I'm shocked. But yeah. and I, th I think that's the thing. That's what I find fascinating. If you, t if you take a look at the, the principles behind Bitcoin, which was ultimately to be a a peer-to-peer -peer means of value exchange without an intermediary. Yeah. And, and that whole thing of like uh, being censorship resistant and not needing a third party, I, I still think it's an amazing concept. Yeah. And, it, and it's just a shame in some ways that the way the Bitcoin protocol has gone, it's made it harder and harder to achieve that dream. So transaction fees are getting higher and higher. The throughput mm -hmm. is nowhere near high enough what's needed for like payment systems and that, uh, which is where you take a look at other cryptos, whether it's Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash yeah. or, or any of the others. They, they seem to be now the, the, the main choices for payments and Bitcoin Core, so the original Bitcoin, people mm -hmm. are thinking of as a store of value, which, which is a shame because it, it loses that real thing it was intended for, which was as a means of payment. I mean, the thing with cryptocurrency, I think that it's very difficult, especially with the Bitcoin thing, because Bitcoin is a very simplest uh, programming. The way the blockchain was built was built simple. And I think that at the time, the guy who built it, who started this idea, I think that he, he, made it, he was either very intelligent and he understood the fact that you can never satisfy the desire of people because if there will be fewer people and the network would be smaller, then I'm pretty sure that Bitcoin will start having the idea of, again of being a payment meme. Mm -hmm. meme. Because back in like 2013, 2015, people were able still to do payments with the Bitcoin network. And I believe that if we would get to that level, they would be able to do it again. But I don't think that people are just going to like stop using the network. Mm. I think that that's where it gets very interesting. This is where I still describe a lot of cryptocurrencies as being experimental. 
mm-hmm. because they're, they're still trying to work out how do they deal with things like scaling, uh, how do they deal with performance issues, uh, and all that, that kind of stuff. And that's where it's yeah. interesting. That's interesting as well. What you were saying before about how you try and explain crypto to people, and sometimes they just don't understand it. And I actually say that th- these days they shouldn't need to understand the technology they're using. They should just be able to use it. It should be really easy yeah. to use, and it should be reliable and work. And it, it's funny, I, I had a conversation a while ago with somebody who said, oh, I'm, I'm not using crypto because it's far too complicated to understand um, how yeah. it works. And it's like, well, do you understand how a bank account works and how payments work? And they thought they did, but when you actually dis- describe the actual technical aspects behind how a payment comes through and everything, they, they, they didn't know it was that complicated, and they don't yeah. need to. And that's the way I, I hope one day in future with Bitcoin and with crypto in general, um, the complexity will be masked, and nobody will notice anybody, and everyone will just use it. So that, that'll be good. Yeah. So. Uh, I- I get what you mean. I think you're right in a way, but I think there is another thing. Like, I think people might end up using crypto, but I I am very skeptical that until there will be like a disaster, like I know the dollar would go to zero in hyperinflation, the euro is going to go bust, the pound is going to go bust. I don't think people are going to change this. Mm -hmm. Because the thing I, I notice the most about people is that they are really convenient they find the pounds and the normal fiat currency they find it convenient so in my opinion i think people would need to experience a pain a really big pain Mm -hmm. for them to change their their way of thinking that's that's my opinion and until Uh, it happens yeah sorry no i was gonna say i i I agree i i I describe i describe people like water that they Mm -hmm. take the path of least resistance so yeah. what, what, whatever is easiest, simplest, cheapest, and safest, that, that they, they will use that. It, the only other thing that you can throw into the mix is the whole thing about censorship resistance, that yeah. if, if, you, if you can provide something that allows them to do things that they wish to do, as opposed to the way that the banking system is going more and more now, where it's allegedly to protect the customer, it's getting yeah. harder and harder to do anything. You know, you, you, now, you now have to do multi-factor authentication. You have to say what you want the money for. You have to see where it's going to, all this kind of thing. It's like, you know what? I just want to pay a bill. Uh, I don't want the complexity. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. So join, join, be, uh, join by Elena as well. Hey, Elena. Good to see you back again. Hey, guys. Hey. Thank you very much. Yeah. How, how's the metaverse world for you? <laughs> Busy. <laughs> <laughs> you got exams coming up, or? Uh, yeah, finishing the second semester now. Okay. And then there will be exams in May. Brilliant. So, okay. Next week is the last week of lectures. Okay. So you know the best way of preparing for exams. What is the best way? Ah, well, the, the, there are two things. I, I told some people about this the other day. Uh, one is understand the marking scheme of the exam. That, that, that's really, really important. So you know beforehand with, where the marks come from and how to avoid losing them. The other thing and how to prepare for an exam is to teach people what you're learning. So I should get you next week to give a talk on the metaverse and everything you've been learning. And you, if you can teach it, then you'll find it far easier in an exam. How about that? This sounds like a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, will, will I have my 180 seconds? Yeah, yeah, yeah it'll be um, the metaverse in 180 seconds. Go. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and you know what? This makes it quite complicated. Yeah. The well, time well, restriction. Well, well, you're right. Uh, and this is the whole thing. Um, I can't remember who said it once about how it is that you only really understand something when you can explain it really quickly and really simply. Uh, And that's the whole thing, trying to explain the metaverse in three minutes. If you can do that, I think that means that you really understand it. So that that, would be a good test for you. So you come back next week, 
you've got 180 seconds to explain everything about the metaverse that people need to know. I'm, I'm just, I'm looking <laughs> forward myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that'd be good. Are, are you, are you enjoying it otherwise? The, the uh, course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> deadlines, the sleepless nights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's good. It, yeah, it, it's it's it's, it, it's it's great to keep learning about things and metaverse and that is fascinating. And and you know the, the crypto connection as well as I'm sure you've been discovering. You know, the, the, the linkages. Yeah, absolutely. So. So, so anytime you want to show any of that, you know, do, do do feel free. We'll we'll give you more than three minutes, you know, because oh, um, because <laughs> um, it it does overlap absolutely. You know, I, I say to people how crypto every couple of years you go through like this this new hype wave of something to do with crypto, and the metaverse was definitely one of them, and then I think. Game Fi took over afterwards, and the metaverse kind of died away a little bit. But there is so much more coming up with the metaverse as well, and linking to things like real world assets and tokenization of property and that kind of thing. Um, and then you look at what some of the the big well known brands have been doing, the likes of Adidas or LVMH, and how they've got a metaverse presence, um, and how they're doing crypto tokens with it as well. I think it's fascinating. The, the, the one surprising one knows that Starbucks is stopping or has stopped because they, they, they had um, a metaverse presence linked in with the loyalty card scheme in the US, I believe. And I saw a couple of weeks ago they're discontinuing that, which is a shame. So, right. do, yeah. do you know the, about the reasons? I, 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 don't, I don't know the reason, no. Um, all, all I know is that, that they had something where they – I, th I think they were using Polygon, someone said. Ste yeah. Stefan might know, actually. Was that right, Poly yeah, Polygon? They used Polygon. They had a partnership, but they closed the partnership. I really have no idea why they closed it. I haven't read much about it. I was also sad because I think that loyalty things would be a big thing for like someone like Starbucks. But yeah, I, I don't know what happened and why. Yeah. And, and it's interesting as well because they, they were linking it in with like a, a metaverse presence mm -hmm. and it's the, the ability to do things like d do a virtual visit to a coffee growing plantation in somewhere in South America, I think it was. Interesting. Uh, and, and, and they had that configured as kind of like a, a metaverse experience where I don't know if you wore a VR headset and went to a, a coffee plantation in Bolivia or something. Um, but they were trying to tie all of that in, in together. So it was re re really, really interesting. It was just such a shame that they stopped it. So, uh, but uh, as is always the case, companies sometimes spin these things up as an experiment, and it's just to see how much interest there is, and may maybe there just wasn't enough interest. So but I, I was looking probably, forward to trying to get out. <laughs> probably also they've done it like as a, as a stock thing, like, Perhaps people would do, oh now Starbucks is doing this with blockchain. Probably they people would invest more because Meta, for example, they changed their name from their Facebook name mm -hmm. it into Meta, and from what I heard, they want to change it into AI. <laughs> I heard. I, I, I would I would not be surprised because that they were very early in into the metaverse space, as you say, by rebranding from Facebook to meta and they invested a lot of money into their metaverse presence but it's one of those things that it's like different generations of people have different ideas and it's yeah. almost as though facebook was the wrong generation people having the ideas for, for the for the metaverse so yeah so that, that that didn't go down to so well and they had their vr headsets as well but i, I think the actual metaverse experience they developed wasn't great so but we'll, we'll see uh, the facebook metaverse is actually quite ugly they made something and it looks like everyone was drawn out and everyone was mocking them mm -hmm. i i don't think that meta would be sorry the metaverse would be something big but probably will be like a network like there will be different providers of the internet and they will all 
speak together and each one will have their own type of metaverse. They will be like, I don't know, like one in Polygon, one there will be perhaps something like in, I don't know, like some Facebook and they will all speak together with some programming language, who knows, mm-hmm. and they will ages. This is one thing I was thinking about to make a company that would link all these metaverses together, kind of like the same as you have blockchains, they don't speak yeah. together, you have this guy who builds, uh, uh, how do you say, Morales. I was thinking that would be a really cool thing to be to build like a standard for all the metaverses. Yeah. And, you know, did you ever play the, how do you call it, uh, Assassin's Creed? No, but I play CS2 and Roblox. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But basically, you know, when when you, let's say you're starting a game, you are in kind of like a, an environment where there is nothing and it's just you and the character. Something mm-hmm. like that, I was thinking that if this would be possible, it would be really crazy and nice. But I don't think the the metaverse is something developed now. I, I think it will be in the future and probably people who invest now in, in the good companies or good games that will go big, they will, they will have a lot of uh, money. Mm-hmm. But I think it's going to be for this market. I, I, I don't see it to be that developed. Probably the next one. I think it's interesting you you mentioned the ability to cross metaverses and this is where I, I keep saying the same with crypto that the really really interesting area to me is interoperability so the, yeah. the, ability, the ability to go across blockchains and, and that in itself would allow you to go across um, metaverses mm-hmm. and that's, that, that sounds really really interesting until you realize, well, actually, Roblox has got its own ecosystem already. Minecraft has got its own ecosystem already. Yeah. You know, CSGO has got it. Rainbow Six has got it. Um, and you start thinking, well, actually, the, the idea of having an avatar, which I've created in Minecraft or something, and, and a plot of land I've built in Minecraft, do I really want to transport that across into you know an, an epic games environment or, or something and the answer is probably not for most people so I, I wonder if in some ways this whole idea of interoperability is a great idea for a few people but there's simply not the commercial demand for it so we'll, we'll maybe see um but yeah it, it goes back go, go on elena why do you think the answer is no for the most of the people? Because it, it is pe- people tend to operate um, kind of um, pigeonholed or, or fixed or whatever that they operate within this domain or this domain or this domain. And the, the okay. whole concept of like having an avatar in Roblox that is transportable across platforms kind of yeah it's quite neat but is there a demand for it you know w- would i actually want my roblox avatar to appear in counter-strike well no because counter-strike for those who don't know is like um a shoot 'em up game so yeah. you, you, you know and so, and so having a roblox character which is like this little square type thing with a few features on it you know it, it, it just doesn't work Likewise, trying to have um, a high granularity image of um, a um, anti-terrorist security guy appearing in a Minecraft game, which is just like little blocks appearing and villagers making funny noises, it, it, it doesn't compute. It, it just doesn't interrelate. So they are just totally different worlds. You do have a very good point, to be honest. But what I'm thinking is, perhaps it might it might be like a status symbol also. Yep. Like if you look on 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 uh, Twitter, there are many people who put them themselves like as a photo. They put like a an NFT that they purchased, yep. and they have a lot of money. So I believe that it might not be necessarily for like, let's say you you change from Rollbox to Counter-Strike. You might not have that specific 
character, but I think it's going to be something like an ID. Mm -hmm. I was looking at this project that is called uh, Andorra or uh, Ardana, something like that with A. I forgot its name. It's actually a very, very beginning project. I'll tell you right now the name because it really boggled my mind. Andromeda. And Andromeda, okay. Yeah, what this project tries to do is to basically create like a kind of like a layer three blockchain. And on that layer, you do everything. And you, if you, for example, let's say use an application from Ethereum blockchain or from Phantom or anyway, you're not going to notice this difference. You just have one wallet, mm -hmm. charge one wallet, and you don't have to change between networks, use bridges and all this this platform would do it for you. So I think I think this would be some convenience, especially for the blockchain when it comes to using the protocols. But I also think that this could be kind of something like Steam. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, they have their own ecosystem. So I do see that it's possible these these games from like Metaverse to, to be able to have something like this. But it's true in a way, the guy, the guy, when we went, when we were speaking last time, he was saying that I don't see the point of of metaverse and the point of uh, these games and NFTs, and he does have a point because you can play games without having these NFTs. Mm -hmm. But I think that there will be games that there will be like they will be crazy. I don't know people would love them and they they would become like a hit, and I'm very sure that some of these games people will want the nfts and will be want to be part of these communities the same as warcraft i, I, was, I was going to offer I, th I think you hit it exactly right it, it reminds me of something elena said several months ago um really interesting so if you think about something that we do need to carry across all of the metaverses is digital identity so the the, the the ability to lock, I mean, this is one of the benefits of the concept of Web3 is that you're no longer typing in a user ID and a password, you're using a wallet as a, as a form of identity. So when you, when you look at identity um, authorization um, and credentials and also personas and, and roles and that, the, the, this is where Metaverse could definitely play in particularly when linked into like an, an NFT type capability. So you could almost use an NFT avatar as your identity across platforms. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that links in nicely. And, and the, the reason I was thinking what Elena said a while ago was because that introduces a security risk then, that it means if I've now got the ability to identify you from your single avatar, I can now track and trace you across multiple blockchains and across multiple metaverses. Definitely the government would love it. Well, yeah, well I'm, I'm sure criminals would as well. True. Um, but yeah, I, and I thought that was really interesting because uh, as Lena mentioned, it, it's like, well, if that gives you the ability to kind of like reverse engineer who somebody is, you then got full visibility of what they've been doing. That's that's possible. You know that there was this uh, this account on Twitter who was always chasing Elon Musk's uh, jet, and Elon Musk wanted to block him because it was chasing him on on real time. Yeah, and he, then he stopped him only with like twenty four hours. You can tell uh, Elon Musk jet with twenty four hours in delay. Mm. I mean, I think I you do have a very good point. But I think people would want to like show off if if people would live online and they would I mean if we say to think we do every single day Zoom meetings and and speak online and videos and all this if people would start and use metaverse as a as a way to I don't know let's say keep lessons and teach people like this would be a big thing imagine like a YouTube but instead of just watching a video you can be right next to the person and and do the yep. same thing. Like this would greatly increase the the education system, in my opinion. Which I, is I, yeah. I, I was going to say I, I I agree completely, and that, that's why I find fascinating about the opportunity to use like a, a metaverse layer as like the 
the presentation layer for education. And mm -hmm. I, I, I saw it a while ago where somebody had gamified training, so it wasn't quite using Metaverse, but it was like a shoot 'em up game to qualify people in, bizarrely enough, um, GDPR rules, so data protection rules, and that they, they gamified it. Now, if you extend that into a metaverse where, you know, to pass your accountancy exam, you have to go down certain routes or something, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there are many good ideas. The thing is that there will be someone who has to do them. That's, that's the p issue I have with the capitalism and mm -hmm. the system. Someone has to build them, and the question is, who would take this? And even if, let's say, I would like to do it, it's, it's my own risk. Nobody would, would help me. That's, that's the issue I see. Nobody, nobody would help and would actually do something. It's, it's just my risk, and I have to find it profitable. Yeah. But... Uh, it, it's the profitable that br brings it back to what I was saying earlier on about cross-platform avatars and that, it, it, it's really a question not of how many people want it, it's a question of how many people are willing to pay for it. Because um, so, sometimes people say, oh yeah, it's a great idea, I'll have that. And then you say, well, it's going to cost you $10 a month subscription or whatever, and they go, I don't want it that much. So it, it, it is generally, it has to be commercially viable. Um, so you need it to be profitable and for there to be enough volume to turn it into a business. Yeah, you do have a point. I, I remember, for example, Instagram, I don't know, I, right now when I look on it, I don't see it anymore. But one, two or three years ago, they implemented this uh, NFT thing in Instagram and you could uh, link your NFT, your, uh, how do you say, Ethereum wallet mm -hmm. with the NFTs. And you could have like NFTs on your wallet. I think it's a really great idea, but they they took it down since then. Another yeah. thing which was I watched and I was impressed, and I think this could be a, a good thing and this could be a hit, is for example, if you use Morales money or these products of this guy, Ivan on tech. He, for example, he uses Ethereum wallet and you can log in with your Ethereum wallet and create your account in, Ethereum, in his application by using Ethereum. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you say, Ethereum account. And I think that this could definitely be an application people would use. They would have like a, a blockchain and they would mm -hmm. just look at the blockchain the same as they do with like other social media accounts. And there's another thing, I don't know if you heard or if you used, I tried and I used Dmail. Have you heard of it? No. Mm -hmm. So Dmail <clears throat> is basically kind of like a blockchain way of sending emails. Okay. So I could write an email and I would have my own blockchain address that would be created by default. And I would use that blockchain address in order to send the email. And that's where you can play with the uh, with the how do you call the NFTs when it comes to this thing to use an NFT to have your own name as your address. So you could link your NFT with with the email and be able to send emails with your own emails. And okay. the, they show at dmail.com, which is similar with Google Mail. But yeah. Well, I, this is this is the thing. Uh, I'll, I'll just. Uh... But pulled up, oh, sorry, that, that saga. Um, I was just looking at, look, I was trying to take a look at um, D-Mail because I, I thought it had something on it. Does, it. does it relate to saga in some way? No. I don't know. I'm sorry. Maybe not. No, it's okay. It, 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 keep on talking. I'll, I'll, I'll have a dig around on that for a moment. Yeah, it's, it's exactly like how you use your Gmail. It looks yeah. a bit different. You create an account and you can create an account, for example, with your own blockchain, with your own wallet, and you can have that and send emails. But the key is that when you send an email, you send it with the username as the blockchain address. Mm -hmm. The nice part is that, for example, if you want to ask for money, you can just put the blockchain address and you can get money through that thing. And 
the other thing which I was actually impressed is I wasn't aware, but in my company where I work at GoDaddy, right now you can link your domain with a blockchain wallet and you can get payment in this way. And I was shocked when I saw it. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, damn. And yeah, you, you can do this in GoDaddy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I just pulled up the, the details on D-Mail, taking a look at what Bybit says about it. Uh, and okay. it's, as you say, it's like a ma messaging with you using the wallets for um, verification and everything. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, the, the thing you were saying about um, effectively ha like having a URL type thing, um, th that's definitely something where I'm, I'm trying to remember what the product was that provided that a while ago where... The whole idea is um, you have like Ethereum addresses, and you and you use them instead of website addresses and that kind of thing. Um, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that. This could be a uh, really uh, uh, ENS, isn't it? It's a, a Ethereum name <laughs> services. ENS. Yeah, well, which which is where in, instead of having like a website address, you have something that is very similar to a website address. But it's a location via a blockchain or via a, a distributed file system. So yeah. lo 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 lots of stuff around that. But yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at D-Mail because, again, it, it looks like it's using blockchain as the transmission layer or, or the security layer in some way, which is where I think there's lots of opportunity to do things still. So uh, JT, who joins us sometimes, um, he's working on a project that, is around video conferencing and voice and messaging uh, where they use blockchain as kind of like a, a authentication protocol layer so that they do it via temporary uh, smart contracts, which means that you can spin up um, a temporary wallet address for your, for your identity and to log you on. And then you, you've got this um, totally decentralized distributed uh, video capability which means it's very censorship resistant. So really interesting <laughs> stuff. So you just been joined by Ifti, it says, whoever Ifti is. Hello. Is Ifti going to come off mute or think, why does it say Ifti? That's, that's the name. <laughs> hey, w w welcome aboard. What brings you along today? Um, a friend of mine just sent me the link and said, listen, this is a great community. You need to, uh, you need to get into this and listen to what they've got to say. Excellent. Well, well, e even better. We, we we love people listening in. We also love to learn about the people who join us as well. So, can you share any info about what what your interest is or where you're based or anything? Yeah, I'm based in Woking, just outside uh, of Guildford in Surrey, and I uh, work in sales and marketing. And I've I've just started working with a uh, tech company who do uh, blockchain uh, uh, sort of work. And uh, what they try and do is actually uh, create. Um, an environment uh, uh, online for companies to be able to purchase uh, properties on blockchain. Ah, okay. So, so I'm just trying to learn more about it, basically. Okay. O o always interesting, because I've been watching real estate on blockchains for a number of years now. Um, and, and it's interesting just how many projects have been with, like, tokenization of real estate or partial ownership of properties and that kind of thing. So but o always an interesting one, definitely. Oh, well, welcome, welcome aboard. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Uh, no problem. So we, we've just been chatting about the, kind, of, kind of the focus this time around, very much around the metaverse, really, which kind of has a link in with um, real-world assets and um, real estate and that kind of thing. Because I'm seeing some examples where people are using um, like a digital twin on the metaverse to represent ownership of physical property and that kind of thing. So I don't know if that's the direction of the work where your project or company is working, but certainly a very interesting area. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, it's all new to me, so I'm still learning um, as, we, as we're working together. Um, so I thought, yeah, maybe you guys can shed some, some light on some of the subjects. Yeah. Well, the, the whole idea of these sessions is that it's, it's a community that I've, I've developed over a number of years. And it is all about learning and sharing together. So if any time you've got anything that you'd like to share, more, more than welcome. You know, we, we do our Gone in 180 Seconds sessions where people actually talk about their project for three minutes and what they're doing and that kind of thing. 
Um, but we also welcome questions. So if you're a complete newbie and you're hearing these weird terms like wallets and um, th th this kind of thing, then feel free, ask away if there's anything you don't know about. And always love to help educate people if we can. Yeah, sounds great. So if you do have any questions immediately, fire away. Go go for it. We've, we've got, um, I, I would consider a, a metaverse expert with us now, with Elena, who's hugely knowledgeable. Um, we've got Gabriella, who's developing a knowledge in the Web3 space, I think. Spe Stefan, I think you, your niche is around Ethereum, isn't it, if I remember correctly? Is that right? Uh, well, I mean, I would say that Ethereum is the one that I have the most experience with, but I'm more like a geek, so whatever, whenever I see something that catches on, I'm like trying to find out. <laughs> okay, cool. And and for me, I've just got a general interest in, it was originally blockchains, uh, and I kind of stumbled into crypto because there's no escaping from it. But I, I just love the whole concept of um peer-to-peer -peer transfers, about immutable blockchains and databases, some programmability and all this kind of thing. So I, I was a consultant for about eight years in this space. Um, I started taking an interest in blockchain around about 2014, 2015-ish. Um, and I still feel as though I'm quite new to this. So I, I've been doing it for like about nine years or something in total now. So. But yeah, if you got any questions or anything, uh, anything. Oh, it says I do have a question. Go for it. Feel free. Yeah, sorry, Just ask Gary. away. I didn't want really to cut you off while you were talking. But yeah, so I do want to ask, actually, because I'm speaking to people who are trying to get into understanding blockchain. And, and the one question they all ask, and, and I asked myself, was how does one learn about blockchain? Mm -hmm. I've looked online for courses. You know, I, can, I know you can go to university and do like courses online. Like, what would you, from, from, from you and the community or the people that we're talking to today, what would you recommend to someone who wants to understand blockchain technology, Web3, and, and just sort of get a basic understanding of the technology, the industry, and what it can do for us? Like, mm -hmm. is there any advice you would give someone like that? Yeah, uh, I would say as a starting point, YouTube's a great place to go for lots and lots of resources. The, the problem is you never actually know if the people who have done stuff on that actually know what they're talking about, which, is, which can be a bit of a challenge. Um, the, one, the one person I would strongly recommend listening to is this guy called Andreas Antonopoulos, who has been in the, the blockchain and Bitcoin and crypto world for many years. Um, He's a visiting lecturer these days. He does all sorts of stuff. He actually wrote a book on Bitcoin a few years ago that's worth checking out. If you're thinking about doing courses, I can thoroughly recommend uh, University of Nicosia do a free uh, MOOC, which is a massive online course, which lasts about I think it's 13 weeks, remote delivery. It's a free course on digital currencies. And... I've yet to find a more in-depth course that describes at a great level um, how blockchains work and how crypto works. I um, can thoroughly recommend that. So check, check out UNIC, University of Nicosia, um, and they do a master's degree in digital currencies. And Elena, did, did you do that course? I'm trying to remember now. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was so, very, very educational. And yes, I do recommend it as well. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. Unless someone wants to do the full master's in blockchain. Do you get a job after? Did you get a job? So, so it's, a, it's only an intro course, the, it, the, the first one. It's, um, it's a 13-week kind of it's a taster in theory. The idea is that if you complete that course, you can then transfer and do the actual master's degree, which is the formal qualification. I meant the master. Do you, if you make the master, do you, can you get companies to be interested in you? I'd, I'd imagine they're going to be a lot more interested in you than if you didn't have the degree. Um, so, so it's it's definitely a useful thing, and, I, and my guess is that um, that's something that Elena will be discovering for herself at some point. Uh, I will share my experiences. Yeah. So, so if, if you're coming back to the point about learning stuff, um, I would definitely recommend. 
I, I think and Andreas did a book, something like Bitcoin Mastered or something, which is really, really good. I would certainly say check, check out YouTube videos. I, I've got yeah. a YouTube channel that, um, that's got some introductory stuff around like what a wallet is and how the crypto side of things works. And I, I've run many courses on introductions, blockchains and that. Um, so there, there's certainly a few, a few starting points. The University of Nicosia, definitely very detailed, very in-depth. Um, I, I don't think you can go wrong with that. And it's free and, and um, a really good session as well. That you, you do learn a lot on that. Um, they're probably the main areas. And also, if you then check out things like some of the crypto um, exchanges like Binance and blockchain.com, um, they actually have education sec sections in them. And in fact, Binance have got, I think it's called the Binance Academy, where you can okay. actually do s studies and that. So if you, if you go to binance.com, and take a look on their website. There'll be like an education section on that, which which is a really good introduction thing. And we've got um, JT's joined us as well. Hey, Fernando. So we've just been asked the question about um, best resources to learn about blockchain and crypto at the beginning. You got any suggestions on that? Yeah, I was listening. First of all, hello. Yeah. Uh, Bear in mind my voice, you know, I've been all week just speaking like for 12 hours, 14 hours, meeting people, you know. I'm in Dubai at the Token 2049 week, you know, so. Yeah, you've been, you've, been, you've been swimming for the week. No, actually just the first few days because then it started to clear, you know, um, yeah. towards Thursday, Friday, you know. Friday was more or less, you could just go almost everywhere, you know. Okay. Yeah, but yes, I mean, you mentioned most of the things that, you know, um, but there's one as well. Uh, I think it's UCLA, uh, because I know the a guy that is, I think he was probably the first professor of blockchain, you know, uh, it was in UCLA, you know, his name is Alex. He's a Brazilian guy. He's, he's, he's really a teacher at, uh, at UCLA for blockchain. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So maybe could be another resource to look at but the rest yes i mean binance is quite comprehensive as we know you know they put a lot of effort on the educational side yeah and uh, andreas and etc uh, so you mentioned everything else already yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was gonna say the, the, the only other thing I'd, I'd offer if it is um avoid anything that is hyping crypto so any anything where people spend their time getting really excited about prices um, I've got nothing to do with crypto learning type thing. So, okay. um, so just be aware that there are some um, crypto influencers, shall we say, yeah, who spend all their time talking about prices going up and down, and they're all talk they're always talking about ma making money, not about learning about the technology behind it. Um, the one exception on that is probably um, Guy from Coin Bureau, who does a really good. Uh, YouTube channel um, yeah. and, uh, and Coin Bureau, I find quite interesting. Where that's talking about the market and what's going on, not not so much the technology. So that, that's probably a starting point for you. I don't know if anyone's got any other thoughts or suggestions. Honestly, if I would suggest something, is just try and read and find out everything and from everywhere. That's my suggestion. But do not get into the trap of of thinking about the prices. Just try to understand it. But depends on what you want. Do you, if you want to understand, to you learn how to make money, then probably learning the, bay, the, the way the blockchain works won't get you money. But what would get you money, for example, I, I know this guy corn called Eric Crown Crypto. And this guy is, was like an investor. I'm not sure exactly what. But he basically uses, does a technical analysis on, on blockchain and on trading. And he's, he's quite good at it, but he uses a lot of data. He basically does statistics on how Bitcoin closes, if it closes a, a, on a Monday good or bad or statistically. And he does all these statistics, which mm -hmm. in, in they are good. But if, if it's good to learn about the, the way the blockchain works and don't think about the money, especially yeah. if you are in <laughs> Yeah. The, the other thing I'd offer as well is um, if there are groups you can join or events that you can go to, 
that that can be quite good. So yeah. I, I used I used to run you know w- what we're doing now actually in person um, in a coffee shop in Buckinghamshire, in fact, so not that far from you. Um, and, and going along to events and meeting other people can be a great way of learning. So do keep coming along to these sessions and, and ask away. Um, I, I remember, I, th- I think Elena, when she started joining, um, it, it was great because when she started, I think you were at the beginning of your journey. Is that fair, Elena? Um, which which meant that it was, it was lovely because she she asked some wonderfully simple questions, which actually make you think, uh, and they're a great way of um, le- learning as well. So yeah, so come come along to events like this, go along to physical events. There are sometimes some conferences. JT talking about Token Twenty Forty Nine in Dubai, which is probably a bit of an overload if you're at the beginning of the journey. And in fact, it might, might be worthwhile uh, asking J- JT. Any particular insights from from the conference, apart from um, it can rain quite heavily in Dubai? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was a lot about the, the new narratives, you know, of RWA and DPIN, and of course the halving, you know, so everybody's going pretty much trying to spin their their, way, their point of view or their project or some projects that they invested or, you know, where, where they are investing their money, which is, you know, some of these new narratives out there, you know? Yeah. And j- just for the benefit of, if, if you don't know, um, J- JT mentioned a couple of terms there. So RWA, which stands for Real World Assets. So that's exactly what your your firm is uh, involved in, I would imagine, which that's is right. the, the tokenization of real world assets. And he mentioned DPIN as well, which, if I remember correctly, is decentralized physical infrastructure, okay. which effectively kind of takes crypto <clears throat> full circle to um, before Bitcoin. There's actually a product called Filecoin, which was an ability to um, purchase um, utility of uh, use of services now on computing. So, like whether that be disk space, that kind of thing, um, which is a physical infrastructure. And we seem to be going through this deep in cycle at the moment, which is kind of revisiting that in some ways. Have I got that about right, JT? Oh, in fact, if, if he's put his hand up now, go, go, go on, ask away. Cheers, Gary. Uh, a question for, for JT, actually, or Fernando, I've got written there, but um, you're in Dubai, uh, JT, and that's actually uh, uh, of interest to the people I'm working with because they're looking to expand into that region. What's the general feeling around real-world assets and, and how, because the property market is massive over in Dubai in the UAE, and obviously they're working with properties. So what's the general feeling around um, properties and real-world assets sort of combining and, and, and being something that they can sort of leverage? Yeah. Um, and, and look, the the feeling is it's always, you know, quite positive about it. But it's not just about properties, RWA, as you know. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of properties been for a very long time. Um, that uh, people are looking real world assets in. We look around all the assets that are around the world. So that's what people are looking. What is going to be the next big thing? Because properties like since 2016, 17, and uh, this RWA is a kind of a new narrative to actually not just look at the property yeah, in terms of assets, you know, assets in general, yeah. Uh, and that's the the interesting part, yeah. With the with the property, I'm not very much into property to be truly honest, because there's like, like I said, so 2016, 17, 18, yeah. So I think people been doing stuff with property, they are continuing, yeah. And it's probably gonna see a lot more now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um so uh I don't know what else to sell tell you, but you know, it's it's very much up a, a trend at the moment here, okay. So basically, uh, I, I, like I said, it, it could be many commodities like um, gold, silver, uh, scrap metal. It could be just about anything when it comes to real world assets. Is what you're saying? Exactly. You know. So um, perfect. Yeah. yeah, and it's quite uh, it's quite some interesting views. You know, uh, a lot of people say, yeah, it's just uh, people trying to spin their way, and uh, but you know, others don't say it is really about that. It's about bringing everything to 
to blockchain and to actually s extract the maximum value, you know, and yeah. also to allow other other to participate on it, you know, because a lot of folks can't participate on on this, you know. So, if for example you, if you're not a qualified investor, yeah, in countries like the UK, yeah, you you know, ninety nine percent of people are totally. Uh, I mean, they can't participate, you know, they're just losing, you know, if if you uh, approach this from a RWA perspective, then you can uh, you tokenize whatever the asset is, anyone can participate on it. So it's a bit better, you know, uh, and this is kind of the, the narrative where people are pushing, you know, let's let everyone in the world participate, you know, in whatever assets that they want and invest whatever money they have without being a qualified investor, you know, so oh, that's kind of where people are pushing, you know. I was going to quickly ask, uh, add as well, just before we'll bring Stefan back in, um, around the regulatory perspective as well. So the Gulf states, we look at uh, Dubai and the financial regulator around crypto assets. Uh, they, they've written some really good stuff on that. And Abu Dhabi is turning it to be something of a, an advocate as well. So the, the Gulf states are definitely aligning themselves in favor of digital assets and the ability to tokenize and real world assets and property is part of it definitely so stefan go, go for it you got your hand up uh yeah i mean i think one of the reasons why they want it is for liquidity and another problem i see with property especially with, for example in uk i was thinking about buying a house and the bank only gives me as a mortgage for the mortgage only thirty thousand pounds and the house is way more than this so I think another thing which would be really cool is if you could just somehow bridge the gap and allow people to be able to, let's say someone can invest in the mortgage of someone else and get share of the house. That's something I, I think it will profit a lot, especially markets and the banks, in my opinion. But the, the, there was actually a, a lot of companies in 2017 and 2018 when we went through the what I describe as the ICO craze, so the, the initial coin offerings, there were a lot of projects then which were very much down that route, whereby they, they were using an ICO token raise to raise funds to buy property to then share out. So it was a um, fractional ownership scheme uh, as opposed to a mortgage. I think I saw about 60 projects come and fail, though, so it did, didn't always work. Yeah, but if I do this in UK, I'll go to jail if I remember properly. I was thinking about trying to to raise a, a project and to promise to people that I'll pay, I'll buy uh, the tokens back and raise money to buy myself a house mm -hmm. and able to like create it in an HMO. But I'm a bit worried that I could go to jail because if I remember properly, you're not really allowed to do something like this if you're not uh, registered with FCA or some financial authorities. You, you, you're right that if you're offering a financial product or a financial service, then you, you come within the remit of the FCA, so the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, and, and this is where a lot of people have fallen foul of those kind of things that they don't necessarily realize that what they're doing falls within various rules and laws about what you can and can't do. And this is where we've seen it in the US as well with the SEC, so the Securities Exchange Commission, where they've had some real court battles with the likes of Ripple um, mm -hmm. and whether Ripple was a security and whether when they launched it, they went through the securities rules and laws and that. Regulators, you're right, do, do take a great interest. And this is where I found it interesting with tokenization of real estate that you're crossing multiple regulatory boundaries that you're having to cross the crypto, yeah. crypto asset registration or, or crypto asset regulation, which is one area. You've then got the financial services regulation. You know, if you're offering what's the equivalent of a loan or a mortgage or a guarantee or something, you, You've got um, FCA potential things. Then, then you've got regulations around property ownership. Um, so you, you're crossing multiple areas, and that's why um, I always recommend if people want to take a look at um, a company in the UK called TPX Exchange, 
And Anthony Abel, who's CEO of that, comes onto this um, session sometimes to talk about what they're doing. They seem to be doing it right because they're looking at crypto regulation, financial services regulation, uh, legal jurisdiction, property law, everything. Um, and they're going about it with the assumption that whatever they're doing is regulated in many ways. So it's so another one to check out. So if if you hope I hope that gives a few thoughts and ideas and suggestions and that. Um, I was going to ask JC to quickly go into the, anything else on token twenty forty nine, but we're kind of out out of time, which is a shame. Yeah, but the pin, just very quickly, the pin is actually becoming a much much stronger narrative, and I think the rest of the year and next year is going to be pushed more and more because you know um, everybody realized that. You know, look, Bitcoin network was really the pin network. Yeah, that's if you think at the core what it the pin is. Yeah, it was about utilizing other people's infrastructure, their servers, mm -hmm. their nodes. You know, to be able to do something in which you know we know what Bitcoin does. Yeah, but rest now people realize we are actually losing that in Web three. You know, it's, you know there are many other things people are doing, and that not many things are decentralized. You know, mm -hmm. so kind of losing what was supposed to be uh bitcoin and uh, blockchain and then web3 and maybe no there's no such thing as a decentralized uh, one anymore you know <laughs> if you yeah. think well so it's uh, the whole thing is it's actually becoming quite strong in the narrative we're going to continue in my opinion yeah and not my opinion that's what people be talking a lot i i, I, th I think you're right we're, uh, and it's we're, we're kind of going around as i said earlier into that big circle where we're coming back to the equivalent of filecoin I, I kind of think of DPIN as being uh, tokenized cloud computing done, done right. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that. It's a lot goes. more than that because yep. you, can, like, yep. you can use that edge, you know. I mean, we have to finish the call. We can talk about that next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be, be a great one. So that's a great opportunity that uh, for those who can join us next week, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit further. Um, if Dee's asking about recording on this, um, th this does go on onto YouTube afterwards, so I, I will publish that. So if you follow me on YouTube or find me, um, for anyone who's interested, just just Google Gary Nuttall Crypto, and I think I fill the first page of all the responses, uh, and you'll find a YouTube link, um, a LinkedIn link, and various, various other things. Do feel free to connect with me and uh, stay in touch. For everyone, thank you for coming along today. I hope you found that of interest and of use. Um, here's to the next week. Have a great, great week, folks. Bye Thank for you. Now. Thank you. See you next week. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.